The Caribbean is a unique region of the world. Most areas that have been subjected to colonization experience one colonizing power that imposed its particular culture. The Caribbean, on the other hand, was invaded and colonized by multiple European powers, each acting at their own geopolitical interest and each imposing its own particular culture. Worse yet, these countries brought with them the terror of slavery, imprisoning and transporting millions of Africans to an alien land. This unique history of immigration has led to a complex cultural amalgamation, which has been highlighted throughout the corpus of Caribbean literature. This melange may seem to be irreconcilable, but it is my contention that the tools of Jungian deaf psychology, namely persona, shadow, and individuation, provide a coherent methodology with which to understand the robust, multi-ethnic, multi-cultural Caribbean identity. I have come to this conclusion in part from my own biography, I'm a three-time, a four-time immigrant who grew up on Curacao, and in part from my doctoral studies in psychological um, aspects of immigration. Indeed, Carl Jung claims, and I quote, almost every country has its collective attitude, which one might call its genius or spiritus loci. Okay. First, I will touch on the work of Professor Michael Gilkes and Professor Rosemont King on Caribbean identity. Second, I will use the Jungian concept of persona, shadow, and individuation to analyze select vignettes from my first novel, The House of Six Lords. In the words of Professor Michael Gilkes, and I quote, this crisis of identity is particularly Caribbean, is a particularly Caribbean theme, amounting at times almost to an obsession. Wilkes, uh, Gilkes is certainly cautious about psychological criticism of literature. He still concedes that the Caribbean author is particularly concerned with a search for identity. Ironically, Gilgis finds the source of such feelings of ruthlessness in the very fact that one could identify as Caribbean culture has no has so many sources, American, Indian, African, European, colonial, etc., that a unified identity becomes almost impossible to recognize. The work of Professor Rosemont King has posited an alternative lens through which to see the complexities of the Caribbean life. In her recent book, Island Bodies, King posits the notion of Caribbean global to the best account for, her, for the reality of contemporary Caribbean life. In her words, the concept of Caribbean global includes the areas, experiences, and individuals with both Caribbean and the Caribbean diaspora. Instead of presupposing a singular notion of Caribbean identity to which the individual does, does not conform, King rather opens up the possibility of an equally diverse and dynamic understanding of the self and society that best accounts for the Caribbean situation. Such an approach asks questions such as how are people and cultures in different parts of the world in conversation with each other? The key to truly appreciating Caribbean culture is to shift the focus from stable identities to circulating ones. It is to reciprocate the influx of European and African culture with a Caribbean outflow. This notion of Caribbean global confronts us with the psychological issues of immigration and the complexity of a multi-ethnic and multicultural identity. did not possess something equivalent to a Caribbean global lens, Mama is not free to participate in the dialogue of her cultural context. She is faced with a binary choice. She can only choose between an ignorant island persona and a wealthy colonial European persona. The Nazis only confounded her plight. The Holocaust forced Mama out from one side of the and into another. 
without a perspective that, that can accommodate complex cultural evolution, her Caribbean inner life is not able to construct a mass to which her ego can genuinely conceive. This alerts us to the presence of Mama's shadow. In Jungian psychology, the shadow is, and I quote, the negative side In recognizing herself as European, she is able to appropriate herself the mask of European colonialists that then leads her to hold the cultures of the Americas in contempt. Her past experience as an immigrant opened her up to, an to the influence of her shadow, but she was not able to positively develop her persona around it. While this presentation so far has focused primarily on the negative responses of Caribbean self, when faced with the reality of immigration, such reactions are not necessary or unavoidable. The conflict faced by Mama in the House of St. George are brought on by the preconception of a cultural binary. Either ignorant, islander, or sophisticated European colonists, such a construct stifles the development of, immigrant, of the immigrant's persona. It prevents what in Jung's thought is called individuation. For him, individuation, as I quote, is the process by which individual beings are formed and differentiated. In particular, it is the development of the psychological individual as a being distinct from the general collective psychology. Individuation, therefore, is a process of differentiation, having for its goal the development of the individual personality. Those who come from societies that present a stable cultural identity may only have to distinguish the individual self from the collective psychology of one culture. But individuation is ever more complicated for the Caribbean self, who must contend with multiple cultures, all with their own respective psychologies. This entails the integration of fragments of various personas into a coherent multiple cultural projection of self. She or he must be able to negotiate the conflict that will certainly arise among rival personas. The character that most closest that character that comes closest to accomplishing the feat of individuation is Mama's daughter Serena. In this passage, Serena remembers the long house of her youth, the house of six doors. The house got its name because it had six doors, three on the ocean side and three on the bush side. The ocean side doors opened directly onto the center of the house. Here, there was a large living room, a dining room, and a kitchen. The bush side doors opened onto a gallery that ran the entire length of the house. Oma had said all the plantation houses were built this way to let in the trade winds flow through. When I asked her why six doors and not four or eight, she told me each door had a purpose. The three ocean side doors were to bring in gratitude, wisdom, and compassion. And the three bush side doors were to let out greed, ignorance, and anger. And in the following passage, Serena returns to Curacao, her country of origin, in order to pick up her green card from the United States Consulate. Serena and her sister, Ilya, revisit the House of Six Doors on their way to the airport for Serena's return flight to California. We crested the hill. I saw the cobalt blue house imprisoned by a tip chain link fence, its right side reduced to rubble and the roof gone. Only one of the six doors was still on its hinges. The breeze surrounded the house. The trees and shrubs that had once adorned the grounds had withered. I couldn't believe my eyes. My heart plummeted. I was devastated to see the House of Six Doors in this condition and horrified to realize that soon it would no longer exist at all. A large sign posted on the fence declared, Coming soon, the country house hotel. We drove on in silence. A half an hour later, as the sun went down, my sister stood on the airport rooftop, waving goodbye as I climbed up the stairs of the airport. 
I wake back, I was sad to leave my sister, but relieved that the curious dog I loved was in my heart and could never be left behind. I was eager to return to California. I stuck the carry on the seat in front of me and pulled out my wallet. Inside, I carried with me a few colored pool souvenirs from the island, and next to it, my green card.